Hi, this is uh, Mr. Fernandez, and I'm here to talk to you a bit about the long-term causes of the American Revolution. Learning targets here um, for this lecture uh, is that you'll be able to describe the conditions in the British North American colonies just before the American Revolution, more specifically around 1750. So what were they like socially, economically, and politically? And you'll be able to debate whether American colonists in the British colonies were growing closer to or apart from uh, the British homeland as a result of some long-term trends that were taking place between 1700 and 1750, just before the American Revolution. Last week we talked about the transatlantic trading system and those economic ties between Great Britain and the American colonies in both the British, in the uh, North American mainland and in the Caribbean. Um, and we talked about um, uh, things like the, you know, the policy of mercantilism um, and, and, uh, and its effects. Uh, and this is what I want to focus on, these exchanges. Now, just because um, we've, we've focused primarily on economic exchanges, um, but it's important for you to note that um, these, uh, this ex these exchanges were also political, social, um, and economic in nature and um, uh, involve the movement of people, ideas, um, et cetera, across, back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean. So the APUSH key concept that's at play here is as follows. Um, you can see it there. The British colonies participated in political, social, cultural, and economic exchanges with Great Britain. We focus on, on the economic exchanges, but to, I'm going to expand that discussion to talk uh, at least more as much about political, social, and cultural exchanges. Um, uh, that, according to the A-Push key concept, encouraged both stronger bonds with Britain and resistance to Britain's control. Um, uh, so these are the two big questions that I want you to consider as you watch this lecture. Um, uh, there's evidence to suggest that these economic, social, political, and cultural exchanges between Britain and the American colonies um, encouraged stronger bonds with Britain. And there's evidence to suggest that these um, political, social, cultural, and economic exchanges with Great Britain encouraged resistance to Britain's control. I'd like you to view this lecture, and as you view it, to think about pieces of evidence from the story I'm telling you that support one or the other of the two sides. In other words, imagine that you're gathering evidence to justify a claim. That claim could be that the colonies developed stronger bonds with Great Britain during this time period, or that claim could be that the colonies resisted British efforts to control them during the same time period. I want you to note um, pieces of evidence on either side of this question to support either of the or the other side. And the stronger the evidence for one side, I, I, I want you to consider putting it closer to the, um, the end of that spectrum. The stronger, uh, and then similarly for the other side. So you're looking for evidence to support this or this claim. Here's the outline. Um, that uh, for this lecture, we're going to be. I'm going to be describing the conditions in the American colonies just before the American Revolution, or the before the period we'll describe as the Revolutionary Period. And um, uh, uh, in other words, what some might consider the kind of the long-term trends that were that were uh, occurring before the the American Revolution. And I'm going to divide up the lecture into social trends, economic trends, and political trends. Let's start with social conditions. Some of this is review from um, uh, something uh, from lessons from the previous unit, um, and a lot of it is going to be new. This is something you've already seen. Um, uh, Long-term trends in the social arena included the arrival to the American colonies of people from a lot of, of non-English uh, uh, places that were not England, non-English. Um, regions of Europe and other parts of the world um, uh, before the uh, before the revolution. So you'll notice that it, some colonial regions had large numbers of people who didn't even speak English. 
Uh, the middle colonies had large numbers of German-speaking and Dutch-speaking people. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, in the southern colonies, uh, in North and you also saw large numbers of Scots-Irish people. Scots-Irish were, uh, were from the British Isles, were from Great Britain, but um, they were people who were very much um, oppressed by by the government and the, uh, the monarch of Great Britain, the government of Great Britain, and so had very little allegiance to the British crown. Um, uh, and in fact, that's the kind of big story I want to tell here, uh, what I think this data tells, and that is that in the American colonies were not overwhelmingly English-speaking. I think a majority of, of people living here were English-speaking, and the majority may have been from England, um, uh, in most colonies, but a very large, in some cases, uh, a very large minority in some cases, like in Pennsylvania, a, a, a small majority of people were those um, who were arriving from um, places in Europe that were not um, uh, either loyal to um, uh, England or reflective of the cultural traditions and language traditions of England either, thus suggesting a weakened tie between the American colonies and the British um, uh, homeland. Another thing that um, weakened ties between Great Britain and the American colonies is in the region, in, in the realm of religion. Um, first, let me tell you a little bit about, or review a little bit, uh, the situation in Great Britain with respect to religion at the time, and then I'm going to tell you how how things. What, what happened in the early 1700s to kind of um, alter the religious landscape in the American colonies? So first of all, as you remember from last unit, the Church of England was the official church in all the southern colonies and in many of the other colonies. Church of England was the, the one that was the most closely al aligned to Great Britain. This was the Church of England, the Church of the King, the Church of the Government of Great Britain. And in most colonies, it was the established church, the official church. So that's one thing to keep in mind, and certainly at the beginning of this period. Um, uh, in the New England colonies, the Congregationalist or Puritan church was also the official, was the official church there in places like Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, uh, and um, uh, in all the colonies, except for a couple, um, uh, there was uh, persecution of, of Quakers, Jews, Catholics, and, um, and, and, pe and, and the people uh, of, um, of those faiths, except in Rhode Island and Pennsylvania, where religious freedom was most prominent, that is, um, was most strongly guaranteed. So anyway, mm, the one big... Uh, trend development that occurred in the, the first half of the 1700s that really altered the religious landscape, like in a very revolutionary way, no pun intended, um, was the Great Awakening. So let me define the Great Awakening for you, and then let me tell you um, how it's related to the transatlantic um, exchange uh, be exchanges between Britain and the American colonies, and then tell you how it impacted the relationship between American colonists, or many American colonists, um, and Great Britain. So first to define it, um, the Great Awakening was a religious movement um, among Christians, who were the vast majority of, um, of, the, uh, of the people living in Europe and in the uh, British North American colonies, uh, primarily in the 1730s and 1740s. And the Great Awakening was fueled by new people, new preachers, new people um, who started preaching new ideas, um, challenging the old ways of doing religion, um, Christian religion uh, specifically. And many of those people were from England. So they represented the transatlantic exchanges between Great Britain and the American colonies. It wasn't just goods and services, but it was also ideas. Among them, new ideas about religion. Um, here's George Whitfield, for example. He was an English preacher, and um, he was a founder of of Mer uh, of um, oops, there we go, of Methodism. So, if if some of you are Methodists, then you are um, uh, 
you owe uh, George Whitfield a debt of gratitude um, for founding uh, that Christian denomination of Methodism. Um, uh, Another guy involved in the Great Awakening and kind of spurring the movement was uh, Jonathan Edwards, who was an American-born um, uh, uh, religious leader. Um, so the Great Awakening was in part inspired by ideas that came from Britain, but also in part inspired by some pe people living here in the colonies who um, embraced some of these new ideas. Um, uh, this uh, image here um, is an example of the Great Awakening. And what I want you to—I want to point out a couple of elements of this image that I think kind of um, summarize the Great Awakening. Here you have the preacher in the middle. Um, he's holding what you might, what might have been called back then, a revival, a a, t a camp meeting. Um, uh, notice how it's out in the countryside as opposed to inside a church. Um, uh, people, re re preachers during the Great Awakening were roaming the countryside, attracting you know sometimes hundreds and thousands of people. Um, to these revivals, these camp meetings, um, to hear uh, who, who, people who were desperate to hear um, them preach about these new ways of thinking about Christianity. Um, also in this image you see that um, uh, the crowd is enthusiastic, um, uh, uh, emotional, uh, like this woman here. Um, uh, for example, the preacher himself is emotional, is um, uh, expressive, um, uh, and then second, uh, thirdly, what you'll notice is that um, the crowd is very much heterogeneous, right? You have this poor, you know, looking guy here um, drinking a beer, so kind of su suggesting he's a, um, uh, you know, uh, um, certainly a uh, regular Joe, non-elite kind of person. You have people who are clearly elites who are wearing fine clothes and powdered wigs, um, uh, and um, so a very much a mixed group of people. Um, uh, here you have uh, one, of the, one of the most um, famous uh, sermons uh, by, um, that represents the Great Awakening. Um, this is a sermon by Jonathan Edwards, one of the great preachers of the Great Awakening. And notice how, when you read it, um, how it um, is very much, uh, um, the imagery is very vivid, um, scary, um, uh, it is it is meant to jolt you out of your sense of complacency and to get and to make you have an emotional response, right? Um, uh, you uh, um, you know that uh, and to and to believe that you know you are a sinner in the hands of an angry God. So read that. Uh, pause and read and read that, and then um, I'll tell you a little bit about what are some of the characteristics of this religion. So the characteristics of the Great Awakening include, like I said before, an emphasis on emotionalism. You know, so for example, the theatrical antics of preachers who would jump up and flay, you know, um, and um, flail about and uh, and shout and and um, and say scary things about God and you going to hell and things like that. Um, uh, the phenomenon of these roving preachers roving, roaming about the countryside and having these revival or camp meetings that sometimes attracted thousands of people who were desperate for a new way of looking at uh, Christianity. Um, and you also had, in the Great Awakening, a, the democratization of religion. So like I said and pointed out in that painting, you had um, you know, ordinary people participating in, alongside um, uh, elites, you know, wealthier people. Um, you had women in the crowd kind of engaged in the same sort of um, uh, emotional um, uh, uh, experience. And of course, and sometimes in many cases, like for example, in the case of the Baptists and, and, um, and some southern churches, you had enslaved people also um, joining in in the, in the revivals. Um, uh, and aside from that, the Great Awakening was also democratic in the in the it's how it interpreted um, uh, the the big ideas of Christianity. Um, uh, it was very much um, uh, the the uh, this new way of looking at religion very much stressed the individual's capacity, like ability, to understand um, uh, Christianity and to connect with Jesus and 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 God. Um, uh, in other words. It went once again, kind of revived this radical notion that 
the Puritans, you know, for a while kind of had before they began to dwindle a bit in, in numbers. Um, uh, and the original uh, Protestants had when they began to fight their battles against the Catholic Church, that individuals um, uh, didn't need uh, fancy rituals and layers of, of bureaucracy and church hierarchies. Like you didn't need a whole bunch of preachers and uh, priests and, um, and other officials in the church to understand and connect with the basic truths of, your, of, of the Christian doctrine that anybody, from the poorest to the richest, from the most uneducated to the most educated person, can and should understand and, and embrace um, the basic Christian beliefs, of, including, of course, the most important one, which is of salvation through Jesus Christ. Um, and, um, uh, and this, of course, applied... This is a you know, radical democratization of religion. So anyway... The Great Awakening. This, I, these ideas were very much um, were very much uh, pop were very popular among Christians in the 1730s and 1740s. The Great Awakening spread like wildfire from Britain um, uh, into the American colonies, and it had some pretty far-reaching effects. For example, um, uh, there was an increase in religious diversity. So you had a lot of new Christian denomination, denominations, Protestant churches. Um, more of them were born as a result of the Great Awakening. So Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, many of these churches are still, of course, very much around today, um, uh, were born during this time period. Um, you had, um, uh, because of all of these new religious denominations, you had um, a re um, increased calls for the separation of church and state. The Church of England was established in most of the colonies, except in Pennsylvania, in Massachusetts, uh, I mean, in, in, in Rhode Island. Um, and then, of course, there was a Congregationalist church that was established in, Ma in Massachusetts, in Connecticut, and, and most of New England. But with these new denominations, with Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians um, increasing in numbers, you had more and more people saying, I don't want to support the Church of England, or I don't want to support the Puritan or Congregationalist church. Um, uh, I am a Baptist, or I'm a Methodist, and I shouldn't have to pay to support the Church of England. So the movement for disestablishing um, uh, church, the churches, official churches, um, really begins with the Great Awakening. Um, and finally, a very important far-reaching effect of the Great Awakening was that fewer and fewer people felt connected to the Church of England. More and more people started leaving the Church of England and embracing these new denominations, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and um, they began, uh, and so um, there was an increase, a, a decrease in that allegiance to the Church of England, which of course, remember, was the official Church of England, um, and so with an increase in, um, or rather a decrease in the allegiance to the Church of England, you also see a decrease in the allegiance to the British government, the British crown, and all things British, at least to some extent. It certainly weakened those ties considerably. Moving on from social conditions to economic conditions, I want to talk to you about how some of how um, these economic exchanges that we've already talked a little bit about um, affected American colonists and their relationship with Great Britain. So to review, um, uh, the, wait, okay, good. Um, last week you, you learned about the transatlantic trade. Um, you learned about the exchange of goods, uh, especially, but now I've ta I'm also talking about people and ideas from Europe. Um, uh, and you learned about the, the efforts by the British government to impose a policy of mercantilism. And then finally, you also learned that one of the, you know, uh, that it was very common for, um, uh, uh, for, American colonists and other people in the in the region to basically break the laws, to um, to smuggle, for example, goods from non-British um, uh, colonies um, or non-British European countries to the American colonies and vice versa, to trade with those places, despite the fact that it was illegal um, in many in many cases. The thing of it is, is that 
there, um, the British had a, a long-standing kind of attitude. Oh, it certainly wasn't an official policy because the British had the policy of mercantilism and um, meant, or at least meant for it to be taken seriously. But the colonists very quickly realized that they could just basically break these laws, <clears throat> smuggling you know, forbidden goods and violating the policy of mercantilism in general, um, and get away with it. Um, uh, so the British had a choice. They could either clamp down on these violations or simply look the other way. And as it turns out, the British authorities simply looked the other way in many cases for much of the... Um, sorry. Uh, oops. No. For much of the 18th century. Um, uh, this came to be known later on um, as an attitude of salutary neglect. The British basically said... Uh, or figured there's no point in uh, trying to, in spending millions of pounds trying to enforce um, the system of mercantilism, <clears throat> when ultimately Britain is, is getting richer as a result of its trade with the colonies, even with all of this widespread violation of mercantilism. The American colonies are thriving and gaining in population. Um, uh, and what's the big deal if they're violating some of these laws? It doesn't seem to be hurting anybody. So the British authorities simply looked the other way for a long period of time. Now, aside from that, um, uh, the uh, economy, uh, the, in, the transatlantic trade had other impacts on the economy of the American, of the um, British colonies. And one of those impacts was what historians have called the Anglicization, I'll underline that, of the, of the American colonies. The more and more trade occurred between the American colonies and Great Britain, the more and more Americans bought manufactured goods from Great Britain, the more and more American colonies began to consume many of the same British consumer goods, fashions, and of course, in their ideas as well, like in the ideas that can be found in books, in newspapers, um, etc. Um, give me a second. Mm. Anyway, um, the, what I'm trying to say is that the American colonies were becoming more anglicized, meaning more like England in a lot of respects because of the transatlantic trade throughout the 1700s, by 1750. Um, uh, and I'm talking about like the material culture of the American colonies. So like the things they bought. For example, look at this teapot. Um, uh, that teapot would have been manufactured in, in England. And this sort of teapot would have become, had, you know, became very popular in the 1740s and 1750s. Um, uh, and in that teapot, you would have seen um, hot, delicious hot tea, which became the drink of choice for most Americans, um, uh, which was imported primarily from Britain, um, uh, and which was drunk not just in major cities or in some regions, but by 1750 was being drunk all over the colonies. And English culture, in the, in the way, of, in the guise of con these kinds of consumer goods, the so and the kinds of clothes that people wore, and the kinds of books that people read, um, began to spread more and more across American, the American colonies and into and away from, oh, in, away from the major cities and into the, cult, the, the countryside and um, inland more and more. Um, uh, in other words, as um, James Dietz, a historian, puts it in describing some of the things that people had in the American colonies, he writes that on the eve of the American Revolution, Americans were more English than they had been in the past since the first years of the colonies. These, this trade with England and the, the, the consumption um, by the American colonists of so many British-made goods made and ideas and fashions made uh, Americans more like, Brit more like um, English people um, more than ever before.
Here, for example, here is a, a you know a typical merchant's ledger in the 1730s and 1740s. These are the sorts of things that most of which would have come from England. So you can read it, but the, if you know all of this stuff was coming from England and people were were consuming these things, buying these things from all the way from you know Maine and Massachusetts to down to Virginia and the Carolinas. Um, even though these colonial regions were so different one from the other, the southern colonies and the New England colonies, they began, they began to look more and more like each other in the kinds of fashions that they consumed, in the kinds of things that they bought, in the kinds of ideas that they embraced, um, despite those economic differences. And that's all thanks to the transatlantic trade between Britain and America, which became more and more um, uh, active in the in the 1740s. Finally, here's T.H. Breen, an, a, a historian, kind of um, uh, driving this point home. He writes that consumption, meaning the buying of certain goods and uh, goods and things like that, drew the colonists together, even when they themselves were unaware of what was happening. The items that appeared in New England households also turned up in the Carolinas. However tenuous communication between mid-18th century colonists may have been, there could be no denying that British manufacturers were standardizing the material culture, meaning the stuff that people had in the American colonies, without too much exaggeration. Staffordshire pottery, so that's like this thing that you saw in this image here, a piece of pottery that would have, um, that would have been popular at the time, might be seen as the Coca-Cola of the 18th century. Um, uh, everybody bought it, everybody had it, everybody felt more British as a result of buying these things. That's what we mean by the Anglicization of the American uh, colonies um, as a result of the transatlantic trade. Now, finally, I want to talk about political conditions in the British colonies between and, and, and the way that they um, were impacted by these in, uh, transatlantic colonial um, uh, exchanges. Um, uh, so things you already know. You already know that um, the American colonies had their own colonial governments. Every colony had its government, more or less representative governments. Um, uh, that um, uh, they uh, um, and that the colonies did made a lot of the their own made a lot of their own decisions. They had considerable political independence from Great Britain. On the other hand, it's important to know that. Their, the representative governments that they did have were very much modeled after the British um, system. In other words, the British Parliament um, uh, was the um, was the model for a lot of these governments. They looked to British the British government as the best government in the world that should be emulated um, and transplanted uh, in the American colonies. And the reason I think that, and the, the reason historians think that the British uh, American colonists felt so strong about how awesome the British government was, was because that because um, uh, the British colonists felt like they were English subjects. They felt like they had um, uh, the same um, rights as English subjects living in the in Great Britain. And by English subjects, I mean that they were citizens, although they wouldn't have used that term. Um, they, they were citizens of Great Britain, um, and they had the same ideas about Great Britain and, and about government um, uh, that people in England had. And those ideas included the fact that government officials, that is, the government, um, were limited in power or should be limited in power. Um, uh, this was very much different from many other European countries. You have to keep that in mind. In France, there was an absolute monarchy. The French monarch could could make any decision he or she uh, wanted, um, and that was that. In Britain, there was a long tradition of limited power for the king, um, uh, uh, and shared power between the king and parliament and the court system. In other words, the different branches of government, um, uh, neither one of which had absolute power. Uh, none of which had absolute power. There was also an expectation of checks and balances, meaning that the king could not have all the power, and the one and the and the way and and the king was limited in power. And, the, and one of the ways you made sure that the king did not go berserker and t and assume um, uh, um, power that he didn't deserve was by 
having that power checked by the power of parliament, which passed the laws. Similarly, parliament could not be allowed to have all the power in the world, so the king was there to check the power of parliament. Finally, the courts were there to make sure that neither one of the other two got out of hand. Um, and so this system of checks and balances, which of course you in the 21st century take for granted as like the way, was very much understood to be the, the, the way that government ought to be um, uh, organized by uh, people living in the American colonies and in England in the 1700s. And finally, the people in the colonies believed, just like the people in Great Britain did, that the, the people ultimately had the power. That, um, that uh, in other words, th they believed in this idea of popular sovereignty. This is very different from believing in the absolute power of the king, uh, who had all the power. Um, uh, and the peop and, um, and this also, and this idea of popular sovereignty therefore made it necessary for there to be at least some expression of the people's will. So elections were expected to be a part of life in Great Britain for at least one part of the legislative branch in Britain that would have been the parliament, in the American colonies that would have been one of the two houses of the, of the uh, colonial uh, governments, or co or the colonial assemblies or legislatures. People expected elections. Not everybody sh had the right to vote in elections. In fact, a lot of, uh, in Britain, most people didn't have the right to vote in elections. But the fact that some people had the power to vote for, the, for some leaders was an expectation that came out of this idea that the people ultimately had the power. And finally, another thing that people believed in England and in the American colonies was that people have certain rights and political guarantees, like there's a list right there, the right to free speech, the freedom of the press, um, uh, the right to, you know, right to tell the government that you don't like what they're doing the right to own property, the right to bear arms for some people, the, the fact that no um, government should ever have a standing army, meaning a permanent army that was always there, ready to be uh, used as a tool to oppress the people, that armies, in other words, should be voluntary or should be assembled only in times of emergency, like when there's a war or something, and whenever there was no longer an emergency, those armies should be disbanded. Because if there's an army, then the king or parliament could use it to oppress the people. This is a very, very strongly held belief by people in England and people in the American colonies who considered themselves English subjects, English citizens. Finally, there was this belief in the rights of the accused. That is, if you were accused of a crime, then you had the right to a trial by jury. You had a right to face your accuser. You had a right to a neutral or objective judge. Those things were enshrined in, in English law and were, and were strongly um, a, a part of the, the political tradition of, the, of, the, of England and the American colonies alike. So finally, where do these expectations come from? Well, they came from such political documents as Ma the Magna Carta, all the way back in 1215, and the English Bill of Rights, which was, looks a lot like the American Bill of Rights, um, uh, but was passed 100 years before it in 1689. And they also came from Enlightenment-era ideas. So, what's the Enlightenment, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. The Enlightenment was an intellectual movement um, uh, uh, in other words, um, a, f a flourishing of certain kinds of ideas that happened in the late 1600s and, er and um, in the 1700s, the 17th and 18th centuries. And these, in this intellectual movement emphasized your brain, like being able to reason through problems um, uh, using the power of your own mind and your individualism. Instead of turning to things like tradition and superstition, it was a rejection of tradition and superstition and an embrace of science and reason and the individual's power. And these ideas from the, uh, these, um, these ideas from the so-called Enlightenment in the 1700s, which of course started in Europe, were imported to the American colonies through these transatlantic exchanges.
I'm going to underline that for you, so because I, I think that's super important. They came from somewhere. Overwhelmingly, they came from Europe. They came in the form of books, these ideas did. They came in the form of newspapers. They came in the form of people who came from Europe bringing these ideas with them. They came with the, with the, uh, um, in, they came with books like John Locke's Treatise on Civil Government, for example. Um, one of the most well-known uh, political, um, phil phil uh, works of political philosophy um, in, uh, in, from the Enlightenment. Um, John Locke was a British author who wrote about um, uh, what government should look like and his ideas very much were, became widespread um, uh, in England and throughout the American colonies as they were brought over by um, English people um, during the 1700s as the transatlantic trade system flourished between the colonies and the um, um, and and the Brit and the Brit and Great Britain. John Locke is best known for his so-called social contract theory. And this is how it goes. The idea is that um, uh, government, uh, that at some point, human beings were in, a, in what he called a state of nature. A state of nature, we have total freedom. That is, this is a, um, this is a time without government, a time when we, people have absolute and total freedom to do whatever they wanted to. And this was awesome because, of course, absolute and total freedom. But, he said, this was also a terrible time because... You know, human beings can be jerks, and people were super jerks to each other in this so-called state of nature that he theorized about. People took people, other people's property. People took other people's lives. People took and, and, and um, enslaved other people, and there was no government there to stop that from happening. So yeah, there was all this awesome freedom, but it was terrible because you, you, you were not guaranteed the, you know, the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to property. So, he said, um, at some point in some distant past, humans began to realize that they needed to form a government. And that that government was there for the express purpose of guaranteeing or protecting people's lives, liberties, and properties from being taken away by other people. Um, uh, that's why people agreed to form governments and that's the only reason people agreed to form governments. This social contract was a contract signed by the people who were desperate to have some kind of protection in this state of nature. And a government, um, and here's how it worked, the people signed away their freedom. So you didn't, no longer had absolute freedom once you signed the social contract. But um, uh, uh, on the other hand, the government um, agreed on it for its part to protect your life, your liberty, and property, prevent other people from taking those things away from you. That is the purpose of government. That is why we created government. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and so um, uh, any government that did anything that was inimical to that purpose, that violated that, very, that social contract, then could be removed. But just think about how revolutionary this is for the time, especially compared to other European countries. In France, the king was the ultimate ruler, period. Whatever the king decided um, uh, was, was, was um, what happened. Um, if the people didn't like it, tough luck. The, the, it was the king's um, prerogative to, to rule as he pleased. John Locke proposed a very different way of looking at government. One that gave the people the ultimate power. The people had the ultimate power because they signed a contract some time ago with the government to, to get the government to protect their lives, their liberty, and property. That's it. That's the reason why people gave up their absolute freedom, that which they had in the state of nature. The government, therefore, must work actively to maintain people's lives, liberty, and property. And whenever the government doesn't do that, or when the government is so awful that it actually hurts people's lives, liberty, or property, John Locke says that those people, because of course they were the ones that have the ultimate power, those people can elect new leaders, or when it's really, really bad, can just totally overthrow the government by force of arms if necessary.
<coughs> this social contract theory um, was the backbone of the Amer the, how Americans viewed government. Um, uh, Americans viewed government through this lens. And this... I, um, and, of course, once again, I want to reiterate that the, this idea was transmitted from England. Oh, no, I'm going to stop here. So, so, anyway, to recap. So anyway, to recap, the British and the American colonists, they felt that they were the greatest country in the world because they had these freedoms and they had this government that featured checks and balances. In the early 1700s, the transatlantic exchanges, that is, the movement of people, um, goods and ideas between Britain and the American colonies, strengthen that passion that American colonists had for the British system of government. It brought these ideas of John Locke, for example, and other Enlightenment thinkers, which um, spread and strengthened this passion that Americans had for Great Britain. They truly believed that the British government was the best government in the world because of the checks and balances and the freedoms that they had, the protections from government, the idea of popular sovereignty. Yes, most British people couldn't vote. Most American colonists couldn't vote. Um, but that wasn't enough to, to, um, to dissuade people um, from believing that the British way was the best way. It was certainly a lot better than people had it in France, in Spain, where the monarchs there had absolute power. Um, uh, and um, uh, so come, you know, come the era of... Uh, so, in other words, come 1750, Americans um, were very much uh, under, the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, under the impression that they were the luckiest people on earth because they um, were British or English subjects. So anyway, um, that's that. Um, uh, again, these are the two big questions I want you to think about. Um, look back through the, your notes, look back through the, through the video and see if you can find two examples from the peri this period between 1700 and 1750 that suggests that um, the, the exchanges with Britain were encouraging stronger bonds with Britain, um, uh, and then two examples that support the notion that these political, social, e cultural, and economic exchanges with Great Britain were encouraging resistance to Britain's control. Until next time.